Welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 59. You know what that means? It means a new week as we continue to study the Gospel of Luke. Now, for some of you, this might be your first day jumping in, or literally, Kevin, how many lessons have we done since the beginning of the year? Uh, almost 170. That'd be 169. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Kevin, you're going to be on your A game this week. I can tell with numbers. This is going to be good. You know, if, or every book we always have uh, a phrase or a word. And obviously to go to Mindy's painting here, with, when you st talk about the Gospel of Luke, it's talking about Jesus' humanity, talking about Jesus as the Son of Man. I, I love this image of the table, uh, even the hands. I was processing a lot of it, but really it's Jesus interacting with the people. And why I want to go with this today is that you have to have, in order to, to serve as the Son of Man, you know, there's a song that everybody and their brother plays in church, on the radio, on Pandora, on Spotify, you name it, Reckless Love is like played all the time. Jeff, would you agree? Yep. I, I love the song still. I'm not, I'm borderline not burned out yet of it. Uh, but I love it because Jesus clearly shows he will do anything it takes to love on people. And when I hear about these lyrics of, of Corey, Corey Asbury, uh, look, I'm not going to sing it. Maybe Jeff can later, but oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, uh, it chases me down, right? Am I right, Jeff? Fights. Oh, till hey, I'm can out. we just have Jeff quote oh. it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop. Okay, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, and leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the, what is that? What is that? I can't even read my own writing. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And it's this, this mentality of, and there's a little phrase in there. He says, I will leave the 99 until I'm found. And that's what we're going to talk about, Luke 15, this reckless love that Jesus has as the Son of Man for any one of us. Like he will go to extremes literally to connect with every, as Warren Wiersbe says, to connect with every single heart. And so, Kevin, if you would, just go to Luke 15, verse 1. And let's kind of just talk about this, this reckless love. Now, <laughs> has anybody ever seen the show Reckless Ralph? The, the movie? Reckless Ralph? Nobody? It's the only thing I think about whenever I think of the song. Re Is it Wreck'em Ralph? Wreck it. Ralph. Yeah, well, see, Wreck it Ralph. <sighs> well, it's not in the song, nor is it in the parable. Apparently, it's not in my head either. So it says this in verse 1. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. Now, th to me, this is classic. Kevin, don't get too excited here. Kevin's already switching me on verses. Like, we're going to hang out on verse 1 for a long time here, Kevin. Uh, I love this paraphrase, all the tax collectors, collectors and sinners. Um, anybody confused by this phrase? Because to me, I thought everybody was a sinner. So how does this work? All of the It's like saying all of the radio guys and sinners. All of Time Revive and sinners. Like, we all fit into one of these categories. Uh, you're either a tax collector, not, not one of those, but definitely a sinner. And in fact, I mean, let's just kind of state the obvious. Let's go to Kevin, Romans 3, 23. I mean, you guys know this. It's on your wristband, right? And we're going to start talking a little bit about these words throughout the week. But for a few have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it doesn't say that. That's crazy. It says, for all have sinned. This is important to understand Okay, just to understand that every one of us, and I love this, we miss the mark. Like if you were to picture me throwing something at the camera, you know, like I would miss it every time if it represented God. All of us have sinned and fall short. So let's go back to verse one. So I'm just, I'm, I'm making this category because in verse two, it says, the Pharisees and the scribes are complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Rich, automatically, because they're complaining, complaining, what are they implying about themselves? That they are not in that group of sinners. Yeah. Oh, how dare Jesus hang out with the tax collectors? How dare Jesus hang out with the sinners? Um, what does that make you then? In their mind, it makes them righteous. In their mind, I don't know if they'd ever say this, but it makes them perfect. Like, they are the men of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, right? And I just want to just make sure we have this understanding, like, they cannot associate themselves. They, they can't come to the table if somebody else is a sinner there. 
oh, I can't, I can't go into this restaurant because there's those people. Or I can't invite them to eat with me at this table because there's those people. If we're not careful, you guys, we could fall into that camp pretty close, pretty easy. And yet, even as Jesus is interacting with people, I mean, he's having, as Nelson says, he's having table fellowship. <laughs> he eats with them. It indicated Jesus, it, they're mad because Jesus is indicating acceptance because he's sitting at the table with him. Does that make sense? So by him sitting at a table, you know, I'll never forget uh, in Revive Texas, it's going to sound like a really bad phrase. Like we had an opportunity to hang out with multiple prostitutes. And I remember there were times where there was a group of us, men and women, so it wasn't just one person, that we were with these people. And it always felt like in the back of my mind, I wonder if people know that she's a prostitute. And I wonder if they would think of me differently if they knew that that she was. You know, like you just have this, you run this filter through your head or, you know, like on Sunday, I hung out with a homeless guy. And it's almost like, no, I had no problem hanging out with this homeless guy who was a criminal from the past. But yet it's the same mentality of, of like, it, it's this perception. Like if you either are, are you concerned about how people are going to perceive you or do you do what Christ says and you just welcome people to the table? And in fact, if we're not careful, we become the shepherds, okay, I'm going to get into this, of the Old Testament. Now think about this, okay, in verse 3, I'm going to go there. It says, so he told them this parable. So Jesus begins to speak to who? The Pharisees and the scribes who are complaining, right? So he begins to tell them this parable, and he begins to talk about sheep. And he says, what man among you who has a hundred, and I love it, it's almost like he's calling out a man card. Like, if you're really a man, I mean, that's kind of the mentality, who has a hundred sheep and then you lose one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. So go back to that song, Reckless Love. Like, reckless love, according to these, is it's this overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It, what does it do? It, it literally, uh, he will fight until I'm found. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. And yet God continues to give himself away. That's the true man card that he's talking about. But on the opposite side, in Exodus 34, verse 1, this is the shepherd mentality that the, the priests have. This is the shepherd mentality that the religious has. Ezekiel 34, verse 1 says this. The word of the Lord came to me. Go to verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel, because look what they've been doing, who have been feeding themselves, and shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? It's, it's almost as if the scriptures verses are, is in what Jesus is saying in this parable, you're becoming more consumed about the 99, more consumed about yourselves, rather than the, the little lost sheep that's, that's gone astray. In fact, go to verse 4 if you would, Kevin says, you have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays, or sought the lost. Instead, this prophet says, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. In other words, the mentality has nothing to do with going finding the lost. It's everything about becoming spiritually fat. Uh, can you go to verse 10, Kevin? I mean, this is the mentality of, of what's happening in the religious mentality. This is what the Lord God says. Look, I'm against the shepherds. I demand, I will demand my flock from them and prevent them from shepherding the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves for I will rescue my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. How crazy is that? The flock becomes food for the shepherds. He says, I'm going to save them from the religious. I'm going to save them from the, the righteous. Scripture continues on in verse 11 and God continues to speak for this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. God is laying out the foundation. If it's not going to be you, I'm going to do it. And that's that reckless love of I'm going after no matter what the cost is. And in verse 12, scripture says this as well. As a shepherd looks for a sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them. There it is. This, this reckless, I, he says, I'm going to rescue the, the one from the, uh, the one that's gone lost from all the places where they've been scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Don't, I love that verse there. It's almost like regardless of the atmosphere, regardless of the environment, I don't care. God says, I'm going to save you from your despair. But yet for some reason, the religious, you know what the religious think? We think we got to get them to, can we get them to come into the temple? Can we get them to come into the tabernacle? Maybe the, 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 the dumb sheep will just slowly scatter and wander back into the place. Sheep don't function like that. We're all sheep. And we don't tend to, to wander back. We just tend to wander and we need the Lord to pursue us. 
Can you go, Kevin, to verse 23, Exodus? I'm sorry, Ezekiel, stay in Ezekiel, Kevin. Ezekiel 34, verse 23, it has this mentality. Ah, this is an awesome picture. He says, I will appoint over them a single shepherd, my servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will tend them himself and, and will be their shepherd. In verse 24, I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. It's crazy that the Jewish religious are the ones complaining that he's hanging out with the sinners. And Jesus clearly is doing exactly what Ezekiel is talking about. He, the one, is pursuing the lost. <laughs> and the other ones are just staying fat on their own righteousness. It's crazy to me how this looks. And when you go back, Kevin, if you would, to uh, Luke 15, thanks, verse, verse 4. Look at this picture. He, he, he leaves the 99 to go after one. Why? Kevin, can you go to 2 Peter 3, verse 9? 2 Peter 3, verse 9, I mean, here, here's the reality, is that God has a heart that nobody perishes. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Oh, you know, let's just let that one sheep go. You know, who really cares about Kyle's over here? Just let him go. Ah, oh, Kevin, he's... He's not worth it. Just let him go over there. Oh, rich. It's just, it's just one rich. I mean, can you imagine God saying that? That's like the foolish thing of all. But if we're not careful, the church plays that game. We play the game that says that one person is not worth it. So we never pursue them. But the model is, is that you have to go seek and find the lost. He doesn't want anybody to perish. John 3, 16. This is the classic, hey guys, here's the sign, the guy with the crazy clown hair, you know, at every game. Unfortunately, he's ruined John 3, 16, but it's still kind of fun. For God so loved the world in this way. Look what it says. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God doesn't want any person to perish. Can I just tell you, he doesn't want ISIS to perish. He doesn't want those that don't know him to die and go to hell. He doesn't want that. He actually wants to go find them. He doesn't want the, the Muslims that are against the Christians. He doesn't want the Hindus that are just kind of like, ah, whatever. He doesn't want the Buddhists to perish. He wants all to have eternal life. And for some reason, I'm just going to tell you, I actually think we stereotype who should be saved and who shouldn't. And you know what I, you know what I think how we base it? Based on our comfortability. And what I mean by that is that we, we sense the Holy Spirit to go, oh, maybe we should go after that one. You'd be like, dude, that's going to mess up my schedule today. Or... You know, that, that actually might cost me something. From what I can see, this reckless love, it's, it, it doesn't hold back. And Jesus clearly says, this is what we're supposed to do. Kevin, can you go to 1 Timothy 2, verse 4? 2 Timothy 2, verse 4 says this. Uh, what, what does he want? He wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know that one? You know, I'll be honest, that one is annoying sometimes. You're like, you stupid sheep, just hang out here with everybody else, right? And so then we naturally just say, well, see you later. <laughs> but that's not the heart of the Lord. That's not the heart of our Father. He literally wants all to be saved. In fact, Kevin, can you go to Isaiah 40, verse 11? I mean, look at this picture, Isaiah 40, verse 11. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And look what he does. He carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. He truly wants to go and find and then literally carry each one of us. The reason you seek the lost, it's a pretty simple statement. It's because you love them. You don't go seek. You don't go and find. If, 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 there's no love. And if you begin to understand what it says in 1 John, why do we love? We love because He first loved us. And when we understand what He's done for us, we'll naturally start doing that for other people. And so the only thing I can conclude about this righteousness is that people don't realize, uh, the righteous don't realize, and I'm talking about the righteous in quotes here, <laughs> they don't realize what He's done because then they keep it to themselves. And it's a weird statistic to me in the church that we don't talk about the Lord, but we don't share the gospel. It, it's a weird concept that we don't seek after the one. 
In fact, here's a cool little, I didn't know this, and you farmer guys maybe knew this, but there's a commentator, Lee Fold, and he said, it's common for a farmer, okay, a sheep farmer, every night to count his sheep. Here's the deal. I mean, I, I love this image. Why would you count your sheep? Because every, every, every sheep, every sheep matters. In fact, Kevin, can we go to John 10? Uh, it's a cool picture in verse 7. I mean, look at, look at this image. Look at this image of, of Jesus. He says, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, here is the sheepfold, right? Like, that's where the sheep would come in. And then eventually there's going to be a door. Who serves as the door? Well, Jesus. So there's the sheep. No sheep are getting past me today. Nope, I'm the door. You're not leaving anywhere. That's awesome. You know what that means? It means that literally he wants to prevent those from getting lost. And it's because he's, he's found them. Now think about this. Kevin, let's go with me here for a second. Go to verse 11. In John 10, verse 11. I just I needed to make the camera guys actually do something right now. You know, like, hey, yeah, let's go this way. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. And what does he do? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I'm not one of those awkward goats. You know, like I'm a sheep. I'm a good shepherd. Look, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's a door of the sheep. He's a good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. Like the reality is this, you guys. In understanding, in order to seek and find uh, those that are lost, once, once you have found them, you guys, you will do everything it can to keep them in the fold. You will do everything you can to literally love on them. And so what does he say? He is the door of the sheep. And then he's also the good shepherd. And I think to me, this is the mentality that we need to have for all of our community. Keep going, Kevin, if you would. Uh, in John uh, 10, verse 16, what do the sheep do? Now, I'm not laying down. Don't worry, Rich. <laughs> the sheep say this, but I have other sheep that aren't of this fold and I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. So you know what happens to all these little sheep? It looks like a dog. But they listen they listen to his voice. And I think to me, like if one, if one slips out, if, if one slips out, uh, the shepherd takes it personal. Because there's nothing that should get past. And so if one gets out, like they actually have to take ownership of this. In Genesis 31, verse 38. Think about this. Like when's the last time that we have been so compassionate about every single soul that we own this? In Genesis 31, verse 38, it says, I've been with you these 20 years. Your ewes and female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams from your flock. Verse 39, I did not bring you any of the flock torn by wild beasts. I myself bore the loss. You demanded, you demanded payment from me for what was stolen by day or by night. If you're a shepherd back then, if you lost a sheep, man, you had to pay up. You had to actually owe up to this situation. Exodus, I actually mean Exodus, don't worry, Kevin. Exodus 22, verse 10. So there is this, this payment that the shepherd carries. And when a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any other animal to care for, but if it dies, is injured or stolen while no one is watching, verse 11, there must be an oath before the Lord between the two of them to determine whether or not he has taken his neighbor's property. Oh man, aren't you guys glad we're not in this text right now? Its owner must accept the oath and the other man does not have to make restitution. So if the guy wasn't watching the sheep, it's not his fault, but now watch in verse 12. But if in fact the animal was stolen from his custody, he must, miss, he must make restitution to its owner. The shepherd is responsible under his care if a sheep gets lost. And so what I love about Jesus saying, I am the door, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to go find those that have escaped. I'm going to go find those that are lost. I feel the burden and the passion, and you ready for this, and the love for every one of these. And the question is, is do we even care if a sheep gets out? Do we even care if there's one just floating around out in Richardson or in Garland or in Middlebury or in Goshen? Do we, do we even care that they're just wandering around? The scripture says we should care for every single one of them. Why? Because we love them. Because there's this reckless love that says, I will do whatever it takes to go find that one. 
And I think what's happened is the reality is, is that these shepherds are hanging out in the fold and they're like, hey, it's kind of good here. The food's good. And then they just keep getting fat and fat and fat and they keep eating their own righteous stuff. I don't know. That's not even a food. And they don't even care about, can I just say this? Exercising out after the lost. How beautiful are the feet? And we say this in every city. It's not how beautiful your seat is, how your rear is. It's how beautiful are your feet because that's what takes the gospel. That's what goes and finds the lost. Uh, Kevin, let's go to one more if we could. Uh, let's go to a minor prophet. Let's go to Amos. Uh, Kevin, can you go to Amos 3, Amos 3.12? The Lord says, as a shepherd snatches two legs or a piece of an ear from the lion's mouth, so the Israelites who live in Samaria will be rescued with only the corner of a bed. How cool is this picture right here? A shepherd is the one who snatches the two legs or a piece of an ear from the lion's mouth. You, you know what that means? Kevin, what does this mean to you? No matter what, you're going to try. No matter how hard the situation no matter how bad the situation, oh, the dude's a, a drug addict, forget him. It's not worth it. Oh, the guy's in prison, it's not worth it. Uh, you can come up with any scenario you want. Honestly, I'm going to say a couple more things. Well, the kid is struggling with being a transgender, just let him go. Or, oh, hey, I've had a daughter who's in the homosexual lifestyle, let's just let her go. According to this, the scripture says the shepherd goes after them constantly until they're found. But we come up with these scenarios that say, oh, that's the lion's mouth. I can't, I can't go there. Oh yeah, you can. And then the scripture just says this, you're going to leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. When he has found it, what do you do? When you pull it from the lion's mouth, what do you do? He joyfully puts this little lamb, this little sheep on his shoulders. And then the scripture just says, in coming home, he calls his friends and his neighbors and they throw a massive party. This would be the great time, as my mom says, get your party pants on. This is a time to, to rejoice with me because I have found, I have found my lost sheep. Like, we should rejoice and celebrate in every person that's been found in the Lord. I love this image. That's why Pastor Dave in Devil's Lake, uh, North Dakota, right? You guys know him well. Every time he saw somebody come to know the Lord, he'd go, Glory! Why? Because he had a party. He knew that that person just went from death to life. That person just got snatched from the snares of hell and death and destruction to now eternal life. And that for me, folks, should never get old. You want to know why I think the church in America is slowly, slowly dying? It's not a very positive message right now. You want to know why? Because we're not having parties. Let's face it. We're not having parties of rejoicing people coming to know the Lord. It gets messy, it gets dirty, but when you find somebody that just got cleaned up, I promise you, you're like, yes, let's bring them to the table and let's celebrate. The church needs more parties on a regular basis. Can you imagine every week? Yep, we're going to have a party. I'll never forget one of our pastors in Indiana, when they started doing baptisms, they moved them from once a quarter to like once a month, and then every once in a while, it was like every other, every other week. I remember our pastor friend said he got complaints from people in the church saying, we're having too many baptisms. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Oh, I don't want to have a party. No, you're right. You'd rather be a spiritual fat person and just eat on your own righteousness. That's what we're saying. But I'm telling you, church, wake up and get out your... Like, that's my closest party horn I can get. Like, we got to have a party. We need to rejoice and gather everybody. And so the only reason we're not partying is because people aren't being found. And when you have a love for the lost... You can't turn this thing off. You know, there's another story here. Dear Lord, I haven't gotten through anything that I thought we were going to get through. But here's what I love is, is, is that, you know, there's, Wearsby says there's a fourfold joy in this process. One is the person is found, right? Okay, so you love them and then the person is found. Okay, so that, that's part of the process. Two, uh, the fourfold joy, right? So how do we see joy? Well, one person is found. Two, uh, the person looking. The person looking, when you find that person, do you know how excited you get? I found them. Like, I love when kids play hide and seek, right? Ah, I found you. You know, like you get excited. There's like this, yes, God used me to help find somebody. That's why he's asking us to do this. Okay, there's another part about where you're going to see joy. I mean, think about this. Others 
get to rejoice. Who doesn't, who doesn't love, <laughs> who doesn't love to hear a story like, oh yeah, last week, uh, somebody came to know the Lord at a gas station. Oh, well, praise the Lord. No, like, yes, somebody at a Texaco came to the Lord. It, it becomes contagious and it begins to rub off. And then finally, you know where else there's found joy? Joy is found in heaven. Look at all of the joy process. When you love them, the person that's found gets to experience joy. The person that's looking gets to find joy. Then this whole group gets to find joy. And then their scripture says there's joy in heaven. In heaven, I tell you in verse seven, in the same way, there'll be more joy in heaven in God's presence over one sinner who repents over the 99 righteous who don't need repentance. Now, some of it get confused. You're like, I don't understand this whole 99 righteous. Like, that seems weird, kind of. Like, in this context, remember who's complaining. The Pharisees and the scribes. This is almost like a, it's a play on words because the 99 righteous, they don't really think that they need to repent uh, because, you know, they never understood that they were ever lost from the beginning. And so they're just even struggling with their own identity. It's a cool picture, you guys. Every time we hit the streets, every time we hit the streets, we get to find those that are lost. As, uh, as one commentator says, those that are out of place, those that should be in the flock, but for some reason they're wandering around, and those that are literally, uh, they're out of the service. They're out of God's service. They have no service mentality. They don't think they have any value. I mean, think about the lost coin right after this. You lose the coin, all of a sudden it doesn't feel like it has value. But in order to find them, you know what that does? You're bringing them back. You're reconciling them to God. You're bringing them back into the fold. You're giving them, as one commentator says, you're giving them purpose. You're beginning to say, no, 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 this isn't meant like this. God has a different identity and a purpose and a plan for you. And that's why I love that God searches for the lost and that's when the religious get offended. Because when the religious get offended, they don't look like us, they don't smell like us. That's because Jesus is just beginning the process. Think about Adam and Eve. They messed up and then who found them? God found them. You see, God is always a father, always a father who's going to pity and take care of his wayward children. And I love what John Wesley, I love what John Wesley says. Wesley says the church has nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. I can't think of a better phrase to wrap this thing up. The church has nothing to do but to save souls. And all throughout Scripture, my friends, all throughout Scripture, Jesus is instructing us to go after the one. So that's our challenge. First and foremost, love them. And then when you love them, think about the person that could be found. Think about as you're looking. Think about how it's going to affect anybody else around you. And guess what? There's a party in heaven as well. All right, guys, this is Luke 15. There's a, a lot more here because you could get into the, the lost coin. You could get into the prodigal son. But hey, let's just go after the one sheep. All right, bless you guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow.